spoiler warning. I have made every effort to avoid spoilers in this video. I have systematically missed lots of clues. I have abjectly failed to solve puzzles successfully. I have done my very best not to find any hidden loot stashes. But be warned, this is a game where you solve puzzles, so God knows what spoilers have slipped their way in. Please note that the graphics quality in this video is even more tragic than normal. Sadly, I wasn't able to hire Google's Sycamore Quantum Computing Processor to run this suck beast of a system hog. Maybe I'll give it a few months until China steals the technology and hire one of theirs instead. No doubt, it will be cheaper anyway. I'm playing Deathloop on a mid-range system with mid-range skills, but just to note, the minimum system requirements to play this game are off the charts. But more of this later. So what is Deathloop? Deathloop is a next-gen first-person shooter from Arcane Leon, the award-winning studio behind Dishonored. In Deathloop, two rival assassins are trapped in a mysterious time loop on the island of Black Reef, doomed to repeat the same day for eternity. It says so, right there on Steam. Just like it says its reviews are mostly positive. And sadly, both statements are untrue. It was made by Arcane Studios Leon, and they did win awards for Dishonored, but personally, I think it's more of an action-adventure, puzzle-solving, science-fiction-based shooter with parkour elements. It's a bit like a sci-fi amalgamation of Dishonored and Prey. Well, that's what everyone seems to think, anyway. I'm also suspicious that the Steam rating has been censored as well. Last time I heard, it was getting review-bombed on PC, for reasons I will discuss later. Don't get me wrong, the game is fine. There is just a lot of fuckery going on. Review censorship included. I would also call bullshit on this being described as next-gen. That's nonsense! If they want to say it runs on next-gen console, I'm down with that. But there is literally nothing next-gen about this game. In fact, graphically, it's at best contemporary, and some would say dated. Look, Peggle fucking 2 is released for PS5. Is anyone seriously going to claim that Peggle is next-gen? Just because you could stay in the Ritz doesn't make you rich. Just because a game releases on PS5 doesn't automatically mean it's categorised as next-gen. Get over yourself. Deathloop has received rapturous applause from mainstream video game journalists, who incidentally probably all played the PS5 version. So naturally, I tucked into this review assuming that the game was shit. I mean, when all mainstream reviewers are raving about a game, that usually means it's a pile of shite. In this case, however, the situation is more nuanced. As they say in Leon. Deathloop is a PC and PlayStation exclusive, apparently for one year, before it hits the Xbox. I guess this was all signed off before Microsoft acquired Bethesda Fuckworks. Sadly, this means two things. Firstly, everyone on Xbox rightly feels fucked over, and secondly, I couldn't cheap out and play this on Game Pass, so I actually had to dip into my hooch allowance for this one. Deathloop is basically what would happen if the same studio that made Prey and Dishonored decided to make a black exploitation sci-fi combat game, lean heavily on well-established practices, mechanics and design elements, and bang out something highly original, where really the only original thing about the game is the plot. In fact, that is precisely what happened. If anyone feels like constant comparisons to Prey and Dishonored are unfair, well don't. It's fair. Sadly, we live in an age where video game developers will leech and flip any assets, mechanics, workflow and game design elements they can in order to trim down on costs. Unbelievable, right? Not really. Increasingly, developers are forced to make more and more game in less and less time, with shoestring budgets and skeleton staff. So if Arcane was a bit derivative in some of their mechanics, 
don't blame them. Blame the publisher. Please blame Todd Howard's mates. In Deathloop you play the role of Colt Van, a dude who seems to have lost his memory. He is stuck in a time loop, doesn't really have much of an understanding of what's going on, isn't particularly smart enough to effortlessly figure it out, but thankfully due to his innate swagger, ability for killing and the player's programmed desire to solve puzzles, he starts trying to work out what the fuck is going on. Because of some kind of physics experiment, you are stuck in the same repeating day on the same island where you have to murder lots of people. You have to get better and better at murder because you have to murder 8 people in one day before the loop resets. It's basically Groundhog Day, except you are murdering men and women rather than trying to seduce a woman. And some other woman is busy trying to kill you. Basically the island of Black Reef seems to be hosting some kind of hedonistic party at the end of the universe, where at the end of the day, the day loops back to the beginning, the party goers get memory wiped and then start the whole thing again, rinse and repeat for the rest of eternity. It's part shooter, mystery, 60s thriller, parkour, murder sim, trap game, whodunit, puzzle solver, OCD simulator, all tied up with a pretty bow that says, every time you die you go back to the start, at the end of every day you go back to the start, at the end of every day you lose your loot, you fortunately have a power called reprise which is a fancy way of saying you really have 3 lives before you actually die and the great reset occurs. You can preserve loot by smearing it in residium which is some kind of science jizz. There are not many locations but you can visit each at morning, noon, evening and night and depending on what time of day you visit, different people will be there doing different things for different reasons and your actions in game affect these things. It's all actually rather clever. Functionality and fuckery. Stylistically it's very 1960s, which is ironic because the graphics seem like they arrived from a previous historical era as well. I personally like the aesthetic, but I simply don't see the quality of graphics I would expect from a game that melts GPUs and sets CPUs on fire, especially since the game is as next gen as Peggle apparently. The basic settings functionality was fine, they were certainly a fuck sight less complicated than the Bethesda end user license agreement and took a fraction of the time to deal with. The start of the game is primarily a bit of wandering around, some flavour, scene setting and time passing, thus perfectly allowing the player to adjust and smooth over any key binding or interface issues before the action really kicks off. After some light tinkering I was firing on all cylinders and the interface had all the basic settings I needed, like the correct field of view and inverting the Y axis because it's hard coded into my brain after all of these years of playing flight sims and playing Doom on a joystick. There was no hardbound keys, nothing odd, no conflicts, it just works and that is probably the only time it just works has actually been the truth in a Bethesda game. And it's incidentally probably the only time I will ever quote Todd Howard without being ironic. The system requirements for this game are a sick joke. You practically need a Cray supercomputer to run it on Mac settings. Who could possibly believe that Bethesda would release a game with Barry basic graphics that requires a £5,000 rig to play it properly? Properly, but still with micro stutter. Well I could, because I bought Fallout 70 fuck and that wouldn't play properly either and then I had to join a group legal action to get my money back. But I digress. The top tier system requirements of this game are shameful considering mid tier games have delivered a more graphically refined experience in the past. This being said it still ran better than most Ubisoft games do at launch. The game ran fine enough from a functional point of view, but out of the gate the graphics were appalling. 
optimised on Nvidia GeForce Experience, they look like a sub-smartphone resolution. Nvidia GeForce Experience basically told me I was having a laugh trying to play this game on anything other than minimal settings. I ended up setting it for maximum performance with the quality right down, then hiking the graphics up one notch to 1080p and locking it at 60fps. That seemed to work well enough like this, but frankly, it still looked a bit shit. The main impedance being that doing long range sniping with iron sights at really long ranges, I struggle to pick out the targets from the environmental objects, and I play with a very large screen with my face pressed up very hard against it. Nobody wins a cookie for guessing this game will get an optimization patch. Or five. I would also note that this might be unique to my build, but when I turn on my FPS counter, it's showing frame rates higher than the 60fps I've capped it at. Maybe this is in error, but if it isn't, that means the FPS cap setting doesn't work. Something I will be able to test later when I edit the video capture, because the sound and the picture will have drifted out of sync slightly. As usual, it's an always online, always spying, permanently logging in and out of Bethesda's servers shitfest. Everyone streams porn these days, they don't download it, so I don't understand Todd Howard's dirty obsession with reading the content of everyone's hard drives, unless he's looking for naked selfies or homemade porn of course. Frankly, I think most of his customers would be happy to just send him that shit, in return for Bethesda pulling the plug on their spyware ambitions. The enemy AI ain't exactly great, but I'm not convinced it's as ghastly as people make it out to be. But it is fairly easy to create a kill zone by just aggroing a group, retreating and then letting them funnel into a choke point. Sure, you can do that with most games, but it's a shame it happens here because the maps are frequently non-linear, so the enemy NPCs usually have a ton of flanking options, but nevertheless, frequently converge on your position like a heat-seeking missile. Or should I say, heat-seeking idiot. You know what I'm talking about, it's the Ghost Recon Breakpoint manoeuvre, where enemies all politely file around the same corner so they can oblige you by letting you kill them neatly in the same little pile. I don't know the science, but it's like the AI is not fleshed out enough. There were definitely moments where the AI was great. The melee folk would bum rush you, the snipers would snipe effectively, and tactics seemed fitted to weapon category. I guess about half the time I felt like the NPCs were intelligent and hunting me down, but the other half of the time they were capable of acting like dum-dums. Then again, sometimes there really was only one effective route to me, so there was that. I don't think it's fair to say that the AI is entirely shit, I think it's better to say that it probably needs more polish. I mean, everybody shit the bed over the allegedly amazing AI in The Division 2, and Deathloop is easily as good as that game. I would note however that the AI seems to behave as a function of progress. The more visionaries you kill, the harder the game becomes. I really should read the FAQs on Bethesda's website more often. But yes, the AI is apparently deliberately dumb at the start and ramps up as you progress. Which is what I basically experienced. Personally, I explored every nook and cranny on every level, thus spending a lot of early game dealing with zombie AI. But as you progress further through the game by killing specific targets, everything gets harder and everything ramps up. At this point I realised why the game had a player character mod that reduces damage from headshots. On reflection, I decided to assume two things. The player character damage is modelled by body parts, and two, late game, they're going to be shooting at your head a lot. Commentators have noted that maybe this is a game that needs to be completed whilst driving hard towards the directives and nothing else and by systematically being a completionist on every level you subject yourself to unnecessary amounts of dumb dumb NPC encounters. But if you forget everything else, just remember that the game gets progressively more difficult as you get closer to the end, and reviews and memes based only on early gameplay will be incredibly misleading about the AI mechanics. 
but they probably will be fuck funny. There were, however, a few moments where the scripting was clearly balked. Like on a mission where my targets would not leave the room they were in and come out into the corridor. They stubbornly would not be drawn beyond the threshold of the doorframe and I could stand there looking at them through the glass and with shots already fired, they just freaked out but refused to open the door and attack. And the door was not even locked. I ended up just opening the door, dropping a turret down and having a wank and a nap whilst the superior turret AI made swift work of the inferior miniboss AI. Also, NPCs do have a dodge ability, just like you. That's annoying, but in a good way. I really need to use the dodge more because the enemy NPCs use it all the fucking time and it makes them incredibly hard to hit at times. The game does need a save on exit. Right now the game has a survival save system. In a way it's a bit like Kingdom Come Deliverance. You can only save your progress and cash your winnings when you reach home base. And just like Kingdom Come Deliverance, they are getting complaints that this means you can't just stop playing when your pizza slash taxi slash prostitute shows up at the door. If you quit out before getting back to base, you lose everything. Just like Kingdom Come Deliverance, they need to introduce a save on exit. A save point I would note which self deletes when you start playing again. That way you can't abuse the save or save scum with it. But if you quit out because the house is on fire, you can pick up right where you left off. Not to mention that it's vaguely ridiculous releasing a game that is this demanding on your system, not optimised and stable at launch, and then expect people to play save free. And I literally just came to that conclusion after spending 90 minutes on a mission only to have my game crash whilst entering the bunker to save. I quite literally said fuck this, hit reboot and spent an hour doing something else instead. Not porn. I could not face the replay right away. Whilst crashing without any save is supremely annoying, it is frankly a rare occurrence, but the problems caused by a lack of save go a little further than that. Basically the game is not session friendly for short bursts. It's not like Call of Duty where you can log in and have a fast 7 minute match. I found myself looking at the clock at times and asking myself, is it really worth starting to play now or will I run out of time before exiting? Once you leave that bunker you are locked into a game session that you can not stop until it's finished. Quit early and you lose all progress. This might be a design choice, but not having a save reference point is not a choice, that is a failure at the point of delivery. There is no game mechanic implications for them allowing you to interrupt your session, save off a temporary save point which self deletes when you re-enter the game later. The way they have designed the game as is provides no design choice advantage other than freezing you in your chair and not letting you stop playing. Omitting to include this feature is dumb and it will no doubt get patched in later. On a positive note, the hand holding was nicely done. Being a bit stupid, stubborn, bad at learning, closed minded, poor at remembering stuff, slow on the uptake, dogmatic, suffering from a bit of a rash downstairs, defensive and opposed to all unfamiliar game systems, I was dreading wrapping my walnut sized proto brain around what appeared to me at least to be quite a bamboozlingly complex set of new video game systems. But the game does an excellent job of tummy rubbing and guiding you as you progress. There's a lot to learn and it teaches you well. It's all learning by doing and offers constant guidance and walkthroughs on the fly. Whoever organised this shit could get a job designing astronaut training programs. I never felt like I was particularly being bombarded by tips or pointers or unnecessary tutorials, quite the opposite. Whenever I found myself thinking, how the fuck does this work, magically I would get a nice little walkthrough right there. 
The game progressed nicely, teaching you as you went. Good job. However, fairly late in the day I became aware of a load of other fuckery to do with this game. Not only is Deathloop optimised less well than a 70 year old Russian tractor, which itself was cobbled together from parts of two other old tractors, and a bus, but the situation is actually even worse than that. And it was largely avoidable. It seems the game runs perfectly on PS5, but it's getting review bombed on PC platforms because the performance issues are so huge. The system requirements are frankly 2030 PC rig levels. But the core problem is… de nouveau. Yes, those miserable fucks at Bethesda once again slipped in de nouveau, kernel level anti-cheat into this game. For those of you who don't know, de nouveau anti-cheat is a fairly ineffective anti-cheat slash anti-copyright software that fails at everything other than hogging your system resources and fucking with your PC at a deep level. I'm talking it inserts itself into the core operating system of your hardware and fucks up your PC performance. It is usually always neutralised and countered by cheat selling companies within days or weeks of every new release. Personally, had it been obvious and had I been warned, I would have had second thoughts about even installing this game until they removed it. Basically, de nouveau screws up your PC so badly that many people won't have rigs powerful enough to run both Deathloop and de nouveau properly at the same time. What fucking cretin organised this particular cake and ass party? So let's recap. Deathloop is optimised for PS5 and not optimised for PC. It is built with the same game engine as Dishonored 2, which similarly suffered from micro stutter and performance issues. Then they slapped on de nouveau anti-cheat just to make absolutely fucking certain that there was zero chance it would run properly on your computer. Then they stuck it on sale, because clearly they thought what could possibly go wrong with a video game that billows smoke out of the back of your rig whilst de nouveau anti-cheat fucks with your operating system. Now combine this with a game design where you can't save mid-session. Wonderful! Did these guys hire some of the former supervisors from fucking Chernobyl to organise this shit show? This isn't an issue of poor management or design pressure, this isn't technical compromise or necessity trumping pragmatism. This is mashed banana for dinner in the asylum, blowing snot bubbles, drooling on your straitjacket levels of grade A fucking stupidity. It actually requires considerable and concerted effort to make these kinds of terrible decisions and then combine them all into one giant terrible decision. Some twat somewhere decided that it was better to ruin the experience for everyone rather than have a few copies pirated on PC or a few cosmetic items hacked in game. And I'll stress this again, ruining the experience for everybody was considered an acceptable price to pay for a few extra units of sales. Because de nouveau is not just anti-cheat, it's an anti-tampering solution which protects DRM solutions on PC and stops people pirating the game for about 48 hours until it's cracked. And that is probably why they rolled the game out with de nouveau and why they will patch it out of the game later. It's tactical, because that is precisely what they did with Prey. They wrecked performance in the primary sales window, then removed de nouveau from the game later. What a bunch of absolute maggots. The contract is such a monument to AAA publisher fuckery that it required its own fuckery subsection. You know the ridiculous contract in Wolfenstein Young Sluts? Well Deathloop's contract is seven screens long. Not seven pages. Seven screens of pages of contract. It is abusive to require people to sign a contract of this size and complexity without providing them sufficient financial reimbursement to hire a lawyer to decipher it. It's about time the industry regulated against these types of contracts or provided detailed legal analysis from a neutral third party lawyer, so we can all understand 
what we signed up for. Frankly, I bought the game. End of story. Why do I need to hire a lawyer to help decipher the contract? Imagine buying a fucking dildo and being asked to sign a giant incomprehensible legal contract which has legal prescriptions on how you use it, how you must behave whilst you use it, and threatening you with prosecution if you use it in the wrong way. Enough of these contracts. It's time to legislate against this bullshit. Their products are protected by the law. If they are making us sign these contracts, it's because they want us to hand them powers and authority not mandated under normal consumer regulations. And it's probably not mandated by law because it's outrageous overreach and entirely unreasonable according to the consumer legislation. The literal and metaphorical politics of Deathloop are worthy of discussion. Deathloop comes with a fair bit of baggage and strangely, virtually none of this baggage can be directly blamed on Arcane Studio itself. The male protagonist is black, the female antagonist is black, the island is called Black Reef. There are white characters in the game, which you, uh, kill. Game director Dinga Bakaba, of African and French descent, was cited for comments such as describing Deathloop as this game is about a black man with a gun. Jason E. Kelly, voice actor for Cult Fan, made a few choice comments about how the role should only have gone to a black actor because reasons. Mainly to do with identity politics. Then the racial parameters inherent to the game were signal boosted by politically tub thumping articles like this. Which, for reasons known only to the author and her critical race theory lecturers at University of South Carolina, includes references to racism in the media, the death of George Floyd, police brutality in the United States, racial discrimination in Europe, white domination of the entertainment industry, diversity, racial ambiguity, people of colour in video games. I quote, seeing brown hands instead of white hands in video games. Problematic whiteness. How the fuck did all these critical race theory concerns end up being shoehorned into an article about a sci-fi game set in the 60s where the main character is named after a fucking horse? I don't think it's controversial to say that Walisha Morris, she slash her from Alabama, might just fucking might have an axe to grind. My honest advice to Alicia and other politically proselytising journotards is this. Don't be their friend. Seriously, you and journalists like you do Deathloop and Arcane Studios no favours at all. She wrote an article about them and used it as a vehicle to talk about her political baggage and in doing so misrepresented the game. Now, whether you agree with her political views or not, articles like this achieve nothing helpful and only succeed at convincing a lot of people, myself included, that Deathloop was going to be a painfully politically correct, woke pile of fuck that preached to the audience. Inserting personal politics into articles about other people's business is politicising something for your own agenda. It's not good journalism. It's like anti-marketing. It's hijacking the subject matter and using it to prosecute a completely different agenda. It's hack work. Maybe Agents of Arcane Studios fed into this narrative a bit. I mean, let's not forget that Dinga Bakaba was one of the game directors on Wolfenstein Young Thoughts one of the most abysmal, woke trashings of a beloved video game franchise ever. And despite the, no doubt Bethesda recruited moderators and fanboys, trying to stamp out any inquiry about the subject on public forums, plenty of people were worried that Deathloop was going to be one giant woke fest shit show as well. Thankfully for all parties involved, especially the customers, Arcane Studios did not fuck this up by trying to appease the woke demographic of the video game community that incidentally doesn't play this kind of game anyway. Deathloop might have two black lead characters, which is incidental, 
It's leaning heavily into black exploitation movie culture, it's coherent as an artistic project, and it's primarily focusing on being a good game. Deathloop is more like Blade than Black Panther. Move along, there is nothing to see here. But given how so many games get ruined by critical race theory creeping into the narrative, the game director's previous involvement with Wokenstein Youngblood, and some of the choice comments made in interviews, you can forgive people for being concerned about whether this was going to be more lecture than video game. In the end, it all turned out perfectly. On an ideological level at least. Black exploitation films tended to be low budget, and at the time James Bond movies tended to be high budget. Imagine a black exploitation movie made with the budget of a James Bond movie with sci fi thrown into the mix. Shaft collided with Edge of Tomorrow, only with a slightly dumber and sometimes funnier protagonist. Thankfully, Deathloop is not some woke lecture disguised as a sci fi action adventure game. You know, like Outer Worlds, that was marketed as a post Fallout sci fi FPS game but turned out to be a lesbian Cupid simulator. Yeah, I said it. About two thirds of the quests in that game are somehow related to the player facilitating the hookup of two girls. If it had been two guys and the game was western themed like Firefly, they could have renamed it Brokeback Spaceship. My point is, if someone asked me in advance if I wanted to play a video game where I got to play Cupid to a couple of lesbians and shoot aliens at the same time, I would have totally signed up for that shit. It just would have been nice to be asked first. Instead, Obsidian just went full tilt trying to make the game as woke as humanly possible because they were trying to please the Stasi on Reset Era and appease all the gatekeeping journalists that were going to review the game. They also knew nobody in the mainstream media would call them out and risk getting branded as homophobic. Don't get me wrong, Outer Worlds was a decent game, but it was as woke as all fuck, and not just the Cupid elements. But fear ye not if you were put off Deathloop because of fears of wokeness. Be reassured that this game is about killing, science things, temporal space stuff cool leather jackets and stylish sofa sets. If they were trying to make some big political statement, well, I certainly missed it, but that's a good thing. Actor Jason E. Kelly's statements about how the character cult needed to be played by a black actor for some kind of authenticity reasons just seemed like a bit of a grift to me. Do actors really have to ethnically match the characters they are playing these days? That's a very Goebbelesque notion that, according to some, only people of certain races can get certain jobs. Personally, I thought racially based qualification was a horrific concept when it was applied to seats on a bus, let alone jobs and livelihoods. Sorry, Mr. E. Kelly. What you said was pure grifting. I get it. You want more acting work. If I was one third Maori, one third Eskimo, and one third Hispanic actor, I would be sitting in interviews telling everyone that all acting jobs should exclusively go to Hispanic Maori Eskimos and nobody else. And I would probably be worrying about how I was the genetic offspring of three people, because that shit only happens during alien abductions or during any normal day at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. But really, if we are honest, there are no logical rules that dictate actors must match the ethnicity of the character they are playing. We all get that point right. This is critical race theory nonsense. Grifting comments aside, it is worth noting that Jason E. Kelly's performance absolutely nails it. I certainly had a few smirks. Jason E. Kelly notably has starred in Lucifer, SWAT, Arrow, and Boom Chick Boom Sketchisodes. Oh, welcome to the Copper Chef! I am your host, Archie Atsushi. From Archie Atsushi's new cell phones, what used is the new black. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that role should have gone to an Asian guy. 
according to Jason E. Kelly's logic at least. And just for the record, Kelly wasn't actually in that episode. On an even more sinister note, Jason E. Kelly was also in one of the best arcade platform puzzle games released in 2020, Doom Eternal. Believe it or not, Kelly was in fact the Doom guy, but let's not hold that against him. At least he was in Boom Chick Boom. Hi! Ah, oh, Chef Jose! I make the pancake con el pi. Oh, it's a look! Very beautiful! The combination of generally funny dialogue and his delivery was very entertaining, although I'm not quite sure why the fuck there was an Ali G joke in the game. Personally, I went off Slasher Baron Cohen when he pulled the ladder up behind him. Years of making excellent edgy comedy. Then when he's rich and famous, he throws shade on edgy comedy, endorses censorship on social media, and then makes Borat 2 a woke borefest. Fuck that guy. It's easy being moralistic and preachy after you have made your money doing precisely the things that you're now claiming are unacceptable. Anyway, my point before all this meandering was that Jason E. Kelly gave a baller performance. He was good casting and acquitted himself well, and for that matter so did the antagonist, Ozioma Akaga, even if I did get a bit sick of her moaning. The other political aspect of the game's release was… the release. For nearly all of this game's development, Arcane has been owned by Bethesda and it was pegged as a PS5 and PC exclusive, which is fair enough. Then Xenomax got bought out by Microsoft and naturally everyone, myself included, was part hoping, part assuming that this would be out on Xbone and also Xbox Game Pass preferably for free because I'm a tight-fisted penny-pinching bastard. Sorry, Dinger. Sadly, for all the ex-boners, the game remained PS5 exclusive, and sadly for all PC master racers, the game runs like a fucked cat on PC. I'm sure you can see where this is going. Xbox players were not only denied on Game Pass, they were denied the game on Xbox full stop for the first year. So not only do you have PC players pissed off with the performance on PC, you have Xbox players being forced to play it on PC and being pissed off with the performance on PC. That is a lot of pissed off in a very confined space. So when people are saying this game is getting review bombed on Steam, I don't think that's true. People are giving this game a bad review on PC because it runs like complete arse. So really, if anyone is fiddling with the review scores and using the review bombing as their defence, they are simply engaging in fraud and review score manipulation. If people think the game deserves a shit score, how dare anyone assume they can sanctimoniously decide for them what their scores really ought to be? That's grade A censorship and deception. I personally think the game itself is brilliant, but... If I was forced to give it an arbitrary score out of 10 on a review site, I would give it 4 out of 10. Because it's got de novo, because it's not optimised, because the system requirements are unreasonable, because it has micro stutter, and because basically, the game runs poorly on most systems. Not badly, not terribly, it just doesn't run properly, and it's slightly unstable. That is why there is a rift between mainstream and non-mainstream review scores. Because if you are part of the noddy press and played 5 hours on a PS5 review copy several weeks before release, it probably ran fine. And you also probably presumed that any glitches would be patched out by launch. Meanwhile, the rest of us peasants on PC feel like we are driving a tractor in a road race. The gunplay in the game completely satisfied my sadistic bloodlust. You get a variety of guns of different archetypes, they drop with different quality ratings with unique versions thrown in. Some have innate perks, and all can take weapon mods, which help align the gun's performance to your own twisted fetishes. I particularly like the Rapier. It's Rapier. What's not to like with a name like that? 
It's a single shot, brake barrel large calibre iron sight sniper rifle slash elephant gun. It quickly became my sniper of choice at long and medium ranges because of its one shot kill potential. Old fashioned? Yes. Devastating? Absolutely. There is a reason why they still make these kinds of guns. Then you have the trencher shotgun. It's a shotgun, what is left to say? In any video game where you might go around a corner, face plant into the enemy and cock it, you need a shotgun. Almost guaranteed insta kill at close range. Deathloop also does not fall for the old shotgun fallacy, which is very nice to see. Shotguns have a more realistic range and stay lethal out to just shy of mid range. The Limp 10 SMG is a decent go to machine pistol. The high quality version has a built in suppressor and combined with a few mods and a penchant for sneaking, it's a perfect tool for quiet, good fella style headshots when someone least expects it. And yes, I'm pretty sure that Limp 10 is a wordplay based on the UMP9. The guns felt chunky and the sounds were nicely done and I personally enjoyed the combat a lot. It's a really nice synergy between well thought out guns, devious scumlord munitions and complementary skills. The verticality is superb, clearly the department of video game verticality was only a few doors down from the department of devious gadgets, who in turn clearly drank in the same pub as the ministry of in game firearms. I'm not sure whether to describe it as mantling or parkour light, but let's just say the climbing and jumping worked well. You also had skills like teleport and double jump and all this combined with an almost universal ability to climb on practically any roof or ledge that wasn't out of bounds led to rooftop sneaking and combat action on par with any title that boasts the same. The physical and vertical design, the gadgets, the skills, the guns all meshed together very nicely. I found myself frequently micromanaging hacked turrets and then using a bunch of them to set up a little 21 kiloton safe space slash kill zone or mantling up to a vantage point and stealth sniping enemies outside a detection range. For a low skill cap fuck bob camper like me, I certainly found plenty of opportunities to play to my strengths. <coughs> Weaknesses. Your default weapon in game is a machete. It's hard equipped and hard bound, I presume so that if the player runs out of ammo completely they are never without some means to do stealth takedowns or murderizing. The uh, machete design is clearly inspired slash homaged slash blatantly ripped off from the vented machete from the excellent post apocalyptical movie Book of Eli, albeit about twice the thickness from my ballpark assessment from the graphics. I couldn't trace the original designer from the movie prop, but this design is frequently referred to as a cookery machete and has a distinctive row of holes removed from the stock of the blade, possibly for weight reduction or reduced friction, but most likely for stylistic reasons. I mean punching or drilling holes out of your fancy kitchen knives is all very fine and dandy but I sincerely doubt that during the apocalypse anyone would bother with that shit when they were making a machete out of an old high carbon steel suspension leaf spring. You can get custom handmade ones on Etsy and other craft sites, but if you were interested in one as more of a novelty item, there are many affordable low budget knockoffs circulating on multiple vendor sites. I can't reliably source the manufacturer but they generally have the air of a mass produced low to mid quality stainless steel blade coming in two standard sizes. I wouldn't recommend you use it for hard drill or wood chopping, but it would certainly suffice during your average post apocalyptic engagement with a human. Or zombie. I'm not a zombieist. Alternatively, Schrade make a very similar cookery machete design with a powder coated blade in 3CR13 steel with a synthetic sheath. I wouldn't suggest purchasing one of these as a serious tool to use in the woods, but if you spotted the machete in game and thought, you know what, 
I would really like to have a book of Eli Machete from a bedroom. Well now you know. I own several different types in multiple sizes from multiple suppliers, because my personal survival philosophy is, two is one, and one is none. And seven is enough for me to lose five and still have enough left to have one in each hand. That's normal thinking, right? So what is my overall take on Deathloop? First and foremost, I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, the mainstream media journotards were drooling all over Deathloop, so naturally, I was salivating all over it because I was assuming it must be atrocious, patronising and woke. Whilst I was initially disappointed by being robbed of an opportunity to take a giant dump on a Bethesda game, my spirits quickly picked up after I had ganked a few NPCs with the rather delectable Book of Eli Machete. What can I say? Just felt like being home. Deathloop is by definition creative in its overall sweep and delivery. And why shouldn't it be? Arcane Studios are based in Lyon, France. And everyone knows the Frenchies are a creative bunch. They invented giant super long bread rolls. Etch-a-sketch. Kissing. For men. Threesomes. The bra. La hen. Industrial scale beheadings. Long before the jihadists started doing it. And they made that art house movie about the geezer who couldn't figure out how to use a fire extinguisher properly. If Arcane Studios are trying to play to the stereotype that the French are a creative culture, well, I reckon they pulled it off. There was definitely a retro-futuristic trope fest going on. This game was made by Arcane Studios, so it naturally and frankly deservedly attracts immediate comparisons to Dishonored and Prey. You can feel the lineage in the gameplay, but it also smells a little of Fallout, and significantly, I definitely got a huge Bioshock vibe right out of the gate. The Fallout vibes I get. Arcane is owned by Bethesda these days. But holy shit, I surprised myself when I sniffed through the legacy of the Bioshock series and discovered that Arcane Studios worked on that franchise too, under the wing of publisher 2K Games. They assisted in the design, animation and art on Bioshock 2. Turns out that in 2010, after finishing work on Bioshock 2, with no other work in the pipeline and with layoffs on the horizon, Zenimax strolled into the building and said, I'll buy that for a dollar. And Arcane Studios, thusly, became part of the Bethesda Empire. To give you an idea of the variety of influences in the game, here are some things that I thought of whilst playing Deathloop. The Prisoner. Groundhog Day. The Flint movies, Fallout Universe, Bioshock Universe, Shaft, maybe even a little influence of Tales from the Loop, and probably most accurately, Edge of Tomorrow, all set in a retro-futuristic kitsch world where the music Girl from Ipanema wouldn't be elevator music, it would be part of the soundtrack but obviously wasn't in this instant because of copyright issues. I don't mean to imply this game is derivative. To be honest, all art is derivative to some degree. I just think it is influenced by a lot of fairly decent stuff. I also think the end result is a very original concept. And keep Edge of Tomorrow in mind. As well as being a very fun and entertaining film, it encapsulates the core mechanics here. Redoing the same day, over and over again until you finally achieve the correct outcome and defeat your foe. Only in that film, you couldn't cherry pick an insertion point, insertion time, or bring loot back with you. You did get to look at a sweaty Emily Blunt wearing nothing but combats and a body armour vest. So that was a bonus. Artistically, the game is very much punching above its weight. According to one interview, the game was already conceived and underway before decisions had been made about framing its art design. Art director Sebastian Miton says that his artistic inspiration came from Saul Bass, which makes perfect sense after having played the game. 
and after having googled Saul Bass. Saul Bass was a graphic designer who was pretty much the Picasso of film title sequences, logo design and film posters through the 50s, 60s and 70s, and probably a lot nicer guy to have a pint with considering that Picasso was a bit of a prick. Bass was one of the first people to appreciate that the opening and closing credits of a movie were insanely important and a feature in their own right, something we take for granted now. You almost certainly know Saul Bass, even though you don't realise you do. He did the following film posters. The Shining, West Side Story, Vertigo and Anatomy of Murder. In fact, he's so ingrained in our artistic culture that Spike Lee's movie Clockers even ripped him off. He also designed the logos for the following companies. AT&T, Minolta, United Airlines and Geffen Records. Thusly, the game was artistically grounded in this 60s period, roughly, and very much took on the creative vibe of the era. Personally, I think they nailed the feeling and artistic design of this game. It feels like it's firmly rooted in a certain era, albeit loosely defined, and you can't precisely date it. It's retro futuristic, has a distinct atmosphere, and it all works together coherently with the music and graphic cutscenes. The difficulty of the AI is apparently an issue depending on whether you turtle as a completionist or run and gun because you chugged lots of Adderall, your game experience and enemy NPC behaviour will pan out very differently. I personally played this game for the story and to solve the mystery so I don't mind the AI being easy. My ego is not invested, but I can see how people run in this game as a test of skill or because they feel the need to be challenged might not like it. The drop in PvP element seems a bit broke. During the course of the game, randomly, and usually when you're least prepared, Juliana, the mithering whining sow beast antagonist who constantly gripes at you over the radio, suddenly teleports in and tries to gank you. Killing her wins prizes. Being killed by her just reinforces how much she annoys you. Players have the option to switch to Juliana from out of game and queue up to take control of a real life Juliana and drop into someone else playing Deathloop and try and gank them. The general consensus seems to be that you queue for hours. If you do get a match, its glitches all fuck, and it's generally a resounding failure. I would simply note that personally, I think it's a novel idea, but likely destined to fail for two reasons. One avoidable, one not. Firstly, People release games entirely predicated on PvP and still don't manage to lock down successful and reliable netcode. Battlefield 4, Battlefield Vagina, The Dark Zone in The Division. Doing a bit of casual PvP is not likely to get the resources needed to do it properly, especially given that this is an afterthought. Secondly, this is asymmetrical PvP, so there will always be queuing problems. Think it through. Let's assume the average player plays for two hours and gets ganked by Juliana twice, an encounter that can sometimes be over in seconds if she attacks at precisely the point you're camping on turrets, but let's say the fight lasts two minutes. For the in-game time played to be equivalent, every Juliana needs 20 to 30 normal players with PvP turned on to keep them occupied for a playing session. Unfortunately, it appears that the number of Julianas does not match up with the correct proportion of PvP enabled cults. Very nice idea in principle, but it requires some very tight tolerances on your player populations, and this does not seem to be happening. And there's no way you can resolve this either by using matchmaking, because people have already picked which side they want to be on. The lack of a traditional save mechanism is great, but the absence of any save on exit is an oversight which needs addressing. Given the game's slight instability, they should also include a rolling reference save option every 10 to 15 minutes in case the game spontaneously implodes. This might compromise the creative vision 
but losing 90 minutes of progress because de nouveau crashed my PC compromises my fucking sanity. So there it is. I loved the plot and the whole time loop thing. It's done very originally, although fans of sci-fi will be familiar with this trope because practically every science fiction show that has run for more than a single season does one of these as a roster filling episode. Dark Matter, All the Time in the World, Stargate SG-1, Window of Opportunity, Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., As I Have Always Been, Star Trek Next Generation, Cause and Effect, Star Trek Diversity, Magic to Make the Sanest Man Go Mad, Fringe, White Tulip, Twelve Monkeys, Lullaby. Some of these shows I have seen, some I googled to make a point. If anyone is going to nerd out on me in the comments, feel free, but try and do it in a coherent way so we can all learn. Fucking me in the ear because I misrepresented one episode of your favourite sci-fi series whilst being funny as fuck isn't tremendously helpful. Unless of course I disrespected Star Trek diversity. If that upsets anyone, please freak out in the comments section. Knock yourselves out. So whilst operating within an existing TV and movie trope, designing a video game around such a premise is a considerable feat of both logic and logistics. I found it frankly a refreshing concept. When I played this game I genuinely tried to engage and figure this out like a systematic puzzle. I can also see how you could just follow mission markers, disengage your brain and bash through this game whilst watching Netflix in the background. I can see it, but I wouldn't advise it. I was completely sold on the science fiction physics time loop narrative and really wanted to glean as much info from the game as possible and found myself in the rare situation of actually giving a shit about the in-game lore and sniffing around every room and into every corner. And I really started to like the character, Colt Van. The loot tension is also a nice touch. You sometimes get to a point where you have to decide whether to call time and cash in your winnings or stay on for that next bit of exploration and possibly get your ass killed and lose the nice shiny weapons and mods that you stole. It's a great added tension. I think you can tell a lot about the genuine collaborative creative dynamics of a video game by the relationship between the developers and the performing artists. Far Cry Blood Dragon is a perfect example of this. Michael Bain and the creative director Dean Evans clearly bounced off each other to a great degree, even ending up doing spoof comedy interviews. And this creative dynamic spilled out into the game. Far Cry Blood Dragon is a classic. Similarly, I found one part of Deathloop where I had to guess a password and spend ages trying all of the options. There were a ton of recorded guesses. They clearly put some real effort into this and had some fun. It was funny, well considered, thoughtful and well crafted. I played games where not one part of the story or script was as well crafted as that one password scene in Deathloop. Mm, you want some kind of password maybe? Cheese wheel? Tenderloin? Analog? Sp sp spittoon, like that word, spittoon? I think the creative and art design of this game will win awards. On a very slightly less upbeat note, Deathloop also represents the victory of stupidity over art. A game not optimised on PC with de novo CPU crushing anti-cheat slapped on top. Now add a game mechanic where you can't save on demand and you have a perfect recipe for a shit sandwich. This is a great shame because the bread, the filling and that green gack they call salad are all lovely. It's just a sandwich spoiled by a thick smearing of shit. As someone who has spent a lot of time chewing on this shit sandwich, I can still taste the yummy goodness through the dog shit. Whilst this game may well theoretically look fabulous and play brilliantly on PS5, many PC users may not be able to fully experience the glory of this game on a computer until 2025 or 2030 when they are retro gaming it on a much higher spec PC. 
because on a standard PC of today, it felt a bit like trying to play Call of Duty on your nan's hand-me-down notebook. And on top of all of this, the end user license agreement is a sick joke. This being said, I'm always griping about how AAA publishers lack creative vision, are shit scared of taking risks, constantly churn out repetitive cookie cutter content, and fundamentally lack imagination. And this game is a highly imaginative, artistically clever, creatively engineered video game. It's a game where you can engage your brain and it has fascinating scientific concepts and cool retro sofas. Despite all its faults and the things it's got kind of wrong, I personally enjoyed playing a game that was this original and interesting. It's so rare to find a studio these days that still goes balls to the wall to create something new and creative, who incidentally also have the skill set to follow through and bring all these fantastical ideas to completion. This game has my vote. I thoroughly liked it. There it is. I went into this review assuming this game would be a woke pile of fuck, but despite certain degrees of fuckery, ridiculousness, and the crushingly weird system requirements, I was gripped. This game is not for everyone. It's probably not shootery enough for FPS fans or puzzly enough for puzzle fans. It's highly stylized, and the mitering bitch got on my nerves a bit, but if you want something original and interesting with a decent protagonist, it certainly filled my hole. I'm a bit OCD. I like guns, and I like comedy killing, especially in video games. But I'm not a huge fan of puzzles, and especially complicated puzzle solving in my games. But Deathloop still ticked all my boxes. I don't know how, but they actually made the puzzles interesting in Deathloop. I wanted to investigate and figure all this shit out. You can kick people off cliffs like the world's angriest kangaroo. You can stab people with one of the world's top 10 machete designs. The guns feel vaguely erotic, and you get to choose whether to turtle through the maps or just go full door kicker and charge right in. In some ways, the whole design philosophy of Deathloop made me think about the reaction to Death Stranding. When you create a game that's so completely different in design, some folks is gonna like it and some folks just ain't. I'm sure when someone played the first rock and roll gig, half the audience just squinted at the stage and said, what the fuck is this? I liked Deathloop. I can appreciate why some people might not, but I liked it. I can hypothesize and inter fucking lecturalize all day long, but the straight up honest truth is that I went into this review primed to rip the piss out of it, but ended up completely engrossed. I was reading all the notes, listening to all the tapes, trying to understand the lore behind the science, loved the style and swagger of the game and the hilarious balls out bravado filled slightly dim protagonist. I wanted to keep playing for the sake of playing and being able to do lots of killing at the same time was just an added bonus. I highly recommend Deathloop as a video game with the following two caveats. Do some more research because it's not going to universally appeal to everyone. And if you're playing it on PC, the performance will, to a lesser or greater degree, lick the sweat off a dead tramp's balls. You have been warned. Arcane Studios did fine work here, and I approve. But for now, good luck, and happy hunting. Bye.